We try not to squeeze the leaf too much so it won't bruise. We just try to cock back the stalk and the leaves and go down and give it a good cut. And then we drop it behind us. The way we harvest is pretty much the way the colonists did, except ours is probably larger now than what they grew because of genetics and fertilization. But basically the way we harvest hasn't changed in hundreds of years. For nearly four centuries, broadleaf tobacco plants covered many fields and hung in many barns across Southern Maryland. But now, only a handful of farmers still grow it, including Mike Phipps on his farm in Calvert County. Well, I always plant a little bit out here so people can see it. And there's a great number of people that always comment how they look forward to seeing the crop out there every year. Maryland tobacco was prized for its slow-burning qualities, and for centuries of local farmers, it was the king crop. The whole economy revolved around tobacco, whether it, the person was a lawyer, a judge, or just a tenant farmer. Everybody grew tobacco back then. It was all over the place. But during the second half of the 20th century, rising awareness of the dangers of tobacco use, such as cancer and heart disease, combined with labor shortages and falling profits, began to whittle away at its popularity. Using money from a national settlement with cigarette manufacturers, the state of Maryland started a buyout program in the year 2000. It helped farmers transition to other crops by paying them to quit growing tobacco. And it was based on the amount of poundage on an average three years prior to the start of the buyout. And it was dollar per pound. So a number of folks took it. Over 90% of Maryland tobacco growers took the buyout, including Russell Brothers Farm in St. Mary's County. So it was kind of one of those things everybody in the neighborhood was, was talking about, said, okay, you know, what are we going to do? How does our future look for this? And we knew the future for raising back in Southern Maryland was kind of on its way out. You know, there really was no future, and the next generation coming along didn't want any parts of it. So it's kind of like, do we take it now or do we wait? And I said, okay, the money's available now. We take it or we don't get it at all. Before the buyout, nine generations of Russells grew tobacco on this land. And for Brian, it was a life he was willing to leave behind. Every generation had the same story. You work all day long in the hot sun for low wages, and it's just something we did. We used the buyout money to improve the infrastructure just here on the farm, buying several pieces of new equipment that we never had before. All that money kind of, you know, it was, it was a, on a 10-year payout. So after the 10 years, we had actually transitioned into other things, so that money was very helpful in transitioning. So it was sad to lose the tradition. It's sad to lose the culture. But, you know, like everything else, it changes and you just move on. You adapt to what comes. While many farmers welcomed the transition, others took it hard. You know, the buyout was a, a big thing. A lot of people debated about whether to take it or not. One farmer told me that he, he wrestled with the notion of taking the buyout. He finally did. He said one day he went in the barn after he had taken the buyout and he sat down and he started crying. It was just an emotional thing because tobacco was his life. That he couldn't grow it anymore was just a huge, huge change. The buyout also came with a few strings attached that kept some, including Mike, from signing on. The way it was structured, it was a life sentence. So if one took the buyout, one could not produce tobacco for the rest of one's life. And I always say life sentences are meant for murder or marriage. <laughs> and I mean marriage in a good way, OK? Um, but uh, I just didn't think that was appropriate. And uh, I, I, I enjoy fooling with it. And so I, I, I didn't, uh, I, I declined. Today, most Maryland tobacco comes from Amish and Mennonite farms along with the modest amount that Mike raises. He'll be the first one to admit it's labor intensive. But for him, filling a barn with rows and rows of loose leaf is a labor of love. Once the tobacco softens or gets in order, as we call it, 
Then we can take it into the stripping room, take it off, and then we can go ahead and grade it for market. And this is what farmers would do in the winter. You'd get a little fire in here and uh, just strip away. 20 years later, Maryland farmers continue to adapt and thrive in the wake of the buyout. Mike now focuses mostly on raising cattle, but he still enjoys keeping a small part of the past growing on his farm. Hi, thanks for watching Maryland Farm and Harvest. If you like this story, leave us a comment. If you want to see more, check out our playlists. We've got videos of cute animals, big machines, delicious farm-to-table recipes, and more.